Hello my friends, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do another get ready with me. I actually just filmed the video and so here's the finished look. We're doing a get ready with me as well as I'm gonna talk you through prison and prison wife lessons from the show For Life on ABC. So if you're interested in learning those lessons as well as watching how I get this prison wife look and we're doing a little bit of a chit chat. This prison wife look? No. This makeup look and we're doing a little bit of a chit chat. Please keep watching. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Ro. I am the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Lives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. I will pop a link to it right up there. We don't glorify or glamorize prison or prison wife life here, but I do share tools and exercises to help you get through this really painful one-shot deal. If you could do me a huge favor before we get started, just hit that thumbs up button. It helps me so much in YouTube. Also, if you haven't yet already, hit that little red subscribe button and ring the bell so you are the first to know every single time I post a new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and more importantly, we are going live more throughout this quarantine time, so you'll know when I do that too. Okay, without wasting any more time, let's get to the get ready with me for this look and let's talk through for life episode. I think we're up to five. Today, I wanna do a really glamorous cut crease because you know, you're sitting in the house doing nothing, you might as well put full blast New Year's Eve evening makeup on your face, why not, right? I saw this in a YouTube tutorial last night and I was like, now I need to try. Cause it is serious. We gotta put the hair all the way up today. Gorge. The beginning of this episode, it starts out with the warden who's catching her cops dealing drugs inside of the facility. And after she questions this one cop, he admits that he's dealing, but he's not bringing it in. It's for a captain. And there was a guy who was in there watching this whole thing take place. I don't know if he was an aide or whoever he was, but when the cop who's dealing leaves, the aid guy asks her, like, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna call the union, his union rep, whatever? And she's like, no, I'm not, because all he's gonna do is deny the whole thing and lie. And it just stood out to me so much because here's the deal. Everybody inside of prison, everybody from staff to inmates, to wardens, to captains, to anybody, is calculating AF. You have to calculate every move. It's like a game of chess in there. You have to not only calculate your next move, you have to calculate your move. If this person, the inmate or the warden or whomever, is gonna go left, you have to calculate how you're gonna go left better than them. If they're gonna go right, you have to calculate how you're gonna go right. If they're gonna spin in a circle, you have to calculate how you're gonna spin in a circle. So you have to not only calculate your next move, but your next five moves, and also every single one of those moves if they do it a different way. It's just the nature of inside. It's crazy, and I love how they really were accurate with displaying that. Side note, if you hear birds in the background, it's really hot in my house today for some reason, so I have the windows open. I actually learned this for the first time when watching this episode. You guys tell me if you knew this, but I certainly did not. Eyewitness testimony is the most unreliable thing, so lineups are extremely unreliable. Aaron had one of his clients in a room with him, and he was showing him two pictures from two lineups, and he said, do you notice any similarities between these two lineups that were done five days apart, something like that? What I mean by lineups is when police have like five or six guys in a lineup and they have a witness come and they have to pick out the person who is who perpetrated the crime. And so the guy says, yeah, this same person is in both lineups. And so Aaron said, Absolutely. Now, this is so intriguing to me because I just love human psychology. He said, here's the thing. Victims of crimes, their brains operate so differently when they're a victim of a crime. So your brain becomes hyper-focused on things and you remember the most intricate details. Like you can remember the color of somebody's sneakers, but then you won't remember the color of their skin. So it's really difficult for people to identify somebody in a lineup. So what happens was, in this instance, the police tricked the people involved and they brought them in for a lineup and they had this guy, Aaron's client, in the lineup. He wasn't identified. And then five days later, they bring the girl back in to identify. They bring the victim back in to identify and that same man is in the second lineup. So her brain remembers him from the lineup five days before, but she doesn't realize that her brain remembers him from there. She thinks that 
her brain recognizes him. So she's like, oh, that's got to be the guy that was robbing me. And so it was an absolutely illegal thing to do because now here you have in the second lineup, you have police kind of coercing her. They're putting pressure on her. Plus it's a second lineup. She wants to make sure that she identifies who did this to her. So he's off the street. Like she has pressure psychologically, unknowingly she's putting pressure on herself. Very, very, very interesting psychology. Very, very sc screwed up situation. Oh, I almost cursed. A side note, I've done a cut crease once in my whole entire life. It was for visit. It came out terrible. So, you know, glutton for punishment has to try again. So anyway, I hope it comes out better this time. Oh, and by the way, I'm just using the same palette as last time, my $8 Delancey palette. I got it on Amazon, so I will link it in the description box below if anybody wants to get it and play with it. It's super cheap. The eyeshadows come out great. The next scene, Maria and Darius have to sit down Jasmine, which is Aaron, the guy who's inside for life. It's his daughter, and Marie is the mom. Darius is the best friend who's now dating the mom. And they sit her down and they're telling her, listen, the DA came to question me, Marie, about the letter that she got signed, the suicide note from episode two. And so she said, you know, they might come and question you and you need to tell them if anybody comes to question you that you're a minor and you do not feel comfortable speaking without your mother and without your attorney. And that's just a lesson for everybody who's related to this life because the reality is that they do illegal things and then they get people to talk and they have statements that were obtained that in a way that wasn't, it wasn't illegal per se, but it's against your constitutional rights. You have every right to ha not speak until your attorney's there. So that's just kind of a lesson. Tell your children, guys, do not speak if you're not present. Do not speak if a lawyer is not present and you get to make the decision if you will allow your child to speak, but you probably shouldn't speak unless your lawyer is present too. Also, Aaron goes to court and he questions the DA on those two lineups. And the lawyer is all bent out of shape because he knows what he did was wrong. So the state's lawyer knows that he's wrong. The judge was like, this was not what we were here for today, but now we have to pursue this because what you did was illegal and this guy could unlawfully be in jail. And so the state's lawyer sees the DA on the stairs of the courthouse when they're leaving. And he says to him, do you remember this case? And the guy's like, it was five years ago. I don't remember it. And then all of a sudden, magically, he does remember it. And he said, yeah, he goes, I remember that you told me to do what I had to do, make him plead out and make this case go away. Unfortunately, that is reality. And now everybody is scrambling in the DA's office because they know that they screwed up. So in another scene, I'm jumping around from my notes, but that's okay. They show Aaron coming out of an elevator in his prison clothes, going into, it's not necessarily like a trial setting. It's more like a mediation type of situation. And he says to the other attorney or somebody, I guess the cops that are supposed to be changing him out because I don't know if you guys noticed that he always changes out from his prison clothes to his lawyer clothes when he is appearing in court. And I don't know if you know this, but when people are on trial, they'll never go to trial in prison clothes, in a jumpsuit or khakis or anything like that because it creates a psychological subconscious bias in the jury's eyes. So you'll always see them changing out into a suit or street clothes. So he asks them like, am I gonna get changed out? And they're like, no, there's no judge or jury here. You don't have to. And I know that they did that on purpose to make him feel inferior. It's the games that they play. During this mediation thing, the attorneys are trying to plead the fifth. Like it is just a hot mess in there. And then at the end, the district attorney tries to get Aaron to agree to a settlement of course he's trying to get him to agree to a settlement. He knows his job's on the line right now. He knows his reputation's on the line right now. There was a part that I wasn't really paying attention to that he's saying that this guy was involved in another robbery. I don't know if he was making that up or not. I'm not sure. I, again, I was not paying attention. I should have rewatched it. It's just, I'm the only person in the United States that goes on more quarantine and gets busier than before, which I'm loving because I'm not bored whatsoever. But anyway, I didn't have time to rewatch it is my whole point. So they go back to prison and they're in the chow hall and Aaron and his client are next to each other getting food. All of the guys, probably like 50 guys are coming up to that second guy saying, 
his client saying, oh, heard you're gonna get out. Oh, heard they messed up. Oh, heard this, that, and the other thing. Inmate.com, which is the rumor mill inside of prison, is real strong. And that is so real, you guys. That happens to Adam all the time. Or like a lot of times, case law will come through. People will get it over email because there's all kinds of organizations that send all of this legal information in through the email sisters, email sisters, the email system. I have so much fun when I make these videos with myself. I just make myself laugh. But through the email systems, either CoreLinks in the federal system or JPay in the state systems. So people will a lot of times, again, human psychology, interpret things the way that they want to interpret things. They'll see things that aren't necessarily there. They'll fit square pegs into round holes just to give themselves hope. So a lot of times people will go around and be like, oh, you're, you're getting out or I'm getting out. And Adam has to kind of show them reality, which he says is a really crummy position to be in because he doesn't want to squash people's hope. But at the same time, like he doesn't want these rumors to spread either. But on the flip side, when good things happen, people tell Adam all the time, like, bro, I know it's coming for you. I know that this went through. I know that that went through. And he said originally when this first started happening, back when he was like really, when he was in the penitentiary and things were very structured as far as the inside society, that he had to live by those rules. In the penitentiary, you just do, you don't have a choice. And he said back then it would make him extremely uncomfortable to hear those kind of things. But as he's gotten older, as he's moved down to a medium security facility, he said that it's gotten a little bit easier and he's more grateful and he accepts those things. And he looks at it now as, this might sound cheesy, but putting it out there that it will happen eventually. So it's just interesting how over time people morph, people on the inside morph in different directions. They could either become more criminal or they can kind of relax a little bit. I guess it depends on how they do their time and the people they interact with, the influences in their lives. In another scene, Marie, Jasmine, and Darius are about to eat dinner and Marie says to Jasmine, my gosh, you could shut the computer. That can wait until later. And she's like, but mom, but mom, I'm almost done. And they flash to another scene and there it's Marie on the phone with Aaron. And she's like, yeah, just give Jasmine a couple more days and she'll have all of those names and addresses for you. You know how she is, like she'll do anything for you. My goodness is that like there is no truer scene in that show, I'll tell you that. Because, I'm joking, but because a lot of times, 100% of us as prison wives and family members will joke with each other that we feel more like a secretary than a wife. And it is a joke, but it's also very serious where a lot of us have to put our foot down, feet down, foots down, whatever, a lot. Be I can't believe I just questioned foot or feet, feet's down. What is wrong with me? Wow. Whoa. Anyway, I'm telling you, I have so much fun making these videos, just making fun of myself. So I totally, totally can relate to that. And again, it's a joke. It's an extremely funny thing that goes around the prison wife pages. Funniest thing that I've ever seen is when a man asked his wife to Google species of chickens. I am not kidding. That is my favorite of all time. She, thank God, has great personality and laughed about it. But she was strong enough to be like, are you kidding me? Okay, I'll get to that when I get to that. And I think a lot of times it's either because they're taking classes in there and they need answers, or I think what happens more is they're, you know, they're bored and there are people inside that are having a conversation and something comes up and then they want to prove that their theory is right. So they have somebody's wife Googling and just turns into this crazy, crazy mess where we're Googling things. The only, only thing that I will ever stop, drop, and Google for is if it is pertaining to something legal to Adam's case that could help him come home. That's it. Otherwise, I will tell him, listen, I'll get to this when I get to this. I'm really busy right now. I don't have time for this. If you need it before next Friday, you're going to have to get your mom or somebody else to do this for you. And we've really got a good thing going with that. He knows. He doesn't ask me for much. He doesn't ask me for things too often. And if it's legal, he knows that I will drop everything because that is for his future and mine. It's not just like a stupid prison conversation. The worst that I've ever heard, though, was a woman who said that she was getting ready to hire somebody to Google things for her husband because she didn't have time. And I had to have like a big sister loving conversation with her where I said, listen, you have such a big heart and I love that. But that type of attitude and that instant gratification is what 
probably led him to where he is in the first place or it kind of helped lead him there. So this is your opportunity to maybe break that cycle a little bit. And so I wouldn't ever hire somebody to Google. I would just say, you gotta wait this out, buddy. <laughs> I will Google when I am good and ready to Google and it fits within my schedule. I will not waste my money hiring somebody to Google things for you just because you can't wait a couple of extra days until I have time, unless it's something that he can't wait for, which would be something legal. And that's when I would hire an attorney, not a Googler, not a VA. If anybody wants to hire me to Google for them, please feel free. I'll give you the PO box to send the checks. That's a joke. Okay. So in another scene, Jasmine goes up to the prison. She takes a bus like five hours. She goes up to the prison to visit her dad. It doesn't seem like it's on a visit day. Even Aaron gets called out of the unit or wherever he was. And he is told that he has a visit and they bring him into this back room. Like it looks like an office. It's not even a visit room. And he's like, Jasmine, what are you doing here? And they were like, well, we thought you could talk some sense into her. So he has this conversation with her. Like you can't be doing this. That would never happen in a quadrillion years ever. You guys add bar inside of prison. It just wouldn't. Her visit is during visit days, during visit hours. And that's it. They're not making extra visits. They're not doing anything unless maybe there is some sort of payoff for that and it's a backdoor deal. I could maybe see that, but just allowing him to see his daughter on a random day isn't happening. During this conversation, she says to him, dad, you are the most important thing to me and I will do anything for you. Oh my goodness, my friends, that hit home so much. I actually started to tear up during that point. She said to him, whatever happens to you is the most important thing to me. Oh my goodness, Jasmine, I feel you with my whole heart. And I posted a video back when this whole quarantine thing started. I got the most backlash that I've ever gotten on a video. The reason I went hard against the CO that said something to Adam is because you guys don't understand if you don't have somebody inside, you don't understand what it feels like to have somebody tell you every single day that your husband is the scum of the earth, that he deserves to be dead, that you deserve to be dead because you stand by his side and everything else that every single one of us has heard. And it's one thing to come for me. It's another thing to come for somebody that can't defend himself. He can defend himself in there, but I'm saying like online, you could talk all this crap about him. You could bash him. I don't have control over who sees that. Somebody that has the ability to open the door and let him out couldn't see that. That's why I come hard for him. He is the most important person to me. Just think about the most important person in your life, whether that be your daughter, your son, your loved one, your significant other, your grandmother who raised you, whoever it is, you know that you turn into a pit bull when somebody comes for them. And that's how I am with him. So I understood Jasmine with my whole heart in that scene. I really did. Girl, yes, that's all I'm going to say about that. That's all I'm gonna say about that. And I talked for like a half an hour. <laughs> so in another scene, Darius says to Marie, something about Jasmine. He said, her father has been in prison since nine years old. She hasn't been a little girl for a really long time. They were talking about how she's mature or has to face things that other kids don't have to face. And yeah, that's absolutely true. When you've been through some stuff, when you're growing up, when you're young, you mature way faster than the other kids. All of those prison kids out there who lost their family, who lost their mother, their father, their loved one, when they were young, they've had to go through some stuff. Prime example, IJ, who I had on video, who started a t-shirt company, is successful and is working with celebrities at 13 years old, also an inspiration to other prison kids whose loved ones are inside. His father went to prison when he was, I think it was like 27 or 28 days old. When you've been through it, you grow up real fast. So IJ and Jasmine and all of those other kids, yes, they've been through it and they are wise beyond their years. Oh, this is getting long. So the only other thing I wanna say about this episode is during all of this, there's so much political stuff, prison politics going on during this episode. Wild Bill is called into the warden's office. She's trying to make a deal with him. He comes out. Aaron is getting framed for being a snitch or something like that because of things that the warden's doing. And at one point he goes to the warden, he's like, listen, you can't keep pulling this stuff because you're gonna get me killed. And it shows just like all of this prison politics. I was having trouble following a lot of it because I wasn't giving this episode 100% my undivided attention. My only thought 
in relation to this. Go watch it if you're interested. But my thought in relation to this is the politics are real in there. And that's why I tell you guys, do not get involved. People inside of there have way too much free time on their hands. They're bored a lot of times. They're watching everything going on. They're speculating and they're drawing their own conclusions and there's code and stuff that's going on in there. So if they see Aaron going up to the warden's office or they see Wild Bill going up in there, he even said to her, he's like, this is the last time you're gonna call me up here because I have to leave here and answer to them. Genuinely, you can get yourself killed if it goes around that you're a snitch and all you were doing was going to the warden's office because if you didn't respond, you wouldn't be following the rules. You wouldn't be where they said that you needed to be and you would get a shot, which is basically a charge in prison. It's a no win situation and it can get really scary. The best part of this episode, in my opinion, is that 50 Cent is making a guest appearance on, well, it was next week's episode on the next episode, but that already happened. So I still have to do my episode six review, but that was really exciting. This episode was good, but I thought it was like a little bit of filler. It wasn't really anything over the top that happened, but there was a lot of realistic stuff that happened on this one. So I really liked that a lot. I just went off camera and I finished my face makeup. I cleaned up under my eyes a little bit did my lips and pulled my hair down. If I was doing this for anything other than being quarantined in the house, I would have put on lashes and I would have used liquid liner. I don't use liquid liner very often. So all of the ones that I have in the house dried out, I had to throw them away. I still think that this look came out really pretty and I think I'm gonna do cut creases more often. You guys, let me know what you think below. If you want me to continue these four life videos, if you want me to continue the get ready with me, get ready with me. Is that how you say it? I don't know. Let me know all of your thoughts. I love doing them just because they save me time. Help me kill two birds with one stone. I hate that phrase. They help me feed two birds with one seed. And that's it. I love you guys. Keep staying strong. Keep loving strong. Keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart to all of yours. I will see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. But until then, stay until then, oh, I can never talk. Stay safe and healthy. I love you. Mwah. I sounded like Teresa Judice. Life lessons from the show. What's the show called? <laughs> because chocolate chips belong in everything when you're quarantining. I just chocolate, you know, makes us happy. Serotonin, all the fun stuff. Bye.